So beginning at verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 2, reading to verse 20, Peter writes, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And so let me remind you of a few things, and we'll move into our study. Peter is, at this point, beginning to write concerning the subject of submission. And he's already spoken concerning proper submission to the government. And he's already also made it clear that good citizens follow the rules that have been established. He points out the government is established by God for the order of society as well as for our protection. And government is established to punish evildoers and should value and praise those who are doing good. That's what he had said in verse 14 when he said, as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So when government is doing more harm than good, and that's why we here in the United States have the opportunity to vote the officials out. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14.34 that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. In Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. And I've been hearing a lot of that lately. So what he's going to speak now about is concerning what we're called household slaves. Now, I have to develop this for you. Now, the way he's writing and the things he's writing, you may or may not already know this, is unusual for the time. You see, when he wrote this, society at large did not regard slaves as fully human. At that time, people became slaves, and they did so in a variety of ways. They could become slaves to becoming prisoners of war, or they became slaves because they sold themselves into slavery. Sometimes children would be sold by the parents into slavery, and sometimes a slave was simply born into slavery because their parents were both slaves. When you look at history, some slaves, it's, it's recorded, led peaceful lives, but for many, obviously, life was a nightmare. Now, this is a question a lot of people ask, so I'm going to address it very quickly. During that time, the church did not in address the institution of slavery in and of itself. And when slavery is addressed in the New Testament, it was not done in what we today would be calling a revolutionary way. Why is that? Well, it's because the church dealt with what was occurring in the body of Christ. The church was not concentrating on the cultural sins of the world. The church was mandated to proclaim a message of freedom but the message of freedom that the church was mandated to proclaim is freedom from bondage to sin. And that freedom comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the church did not get caught up in a campaign against slavery. The church got caught up in a campaign against the slavery of sin, preaching the gospel to set people free. You see, that's the greatest need. And that's, that's not to exclude the wrongs of slavery, but it's to point to the wonderfulness of salvation. It's like what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, 21. He said, were you called while a slave? Listen to what he said. Do not be concerned about it. If you can be made free, rather use it. But his, he was saying the whole point is not fighting to be free, but if given opportunity, of course, take the opportunity. You see, in the New Testament, slavery is addressed in the context of life in the church. Now, the world looked at slavery as normal, and the world looked at slaves as below human. But when slavery is mentioned, it isn't necessarily condemned. And yet, <laughs> Christianity triumphed over slavery. It actually had the effect that Jesus intended the church to have. In Matthew 5.13, he said, "'You are the salt of the earth.'" But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it, how shall the earth be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the salt. You are the light. 
You see, as an empire, Rome was built on the back of slave labor. It's estimated that 60 million slaves lived in the Roman Empire. And so as a class of people, they, they were regarded as tools, work tools, that had no value. One Roman writer divided agricultural instruments into three classes. He called them the articulate, which are slaves, the inarticulate, which are animals, and the mute, which were simply work tools. There was an individual who wrote at that time, his name was Cotto, and he had said, listen to this, old slaves should be thrown on a dump. And when a slave is ill, do not feed him anything. It's not worth your money. Take six slaves and throw them away because they are nothing but inefficient tools. So without attacking head-on slavery, Christianity still triumphed over it. But how? Well, that's, I think, it's, it's the beauty of the gospel. One, it changed the master's attitude towards a slave. They were not living tools. They were people. And as people, they were worthy of love, respect, as well as compensation. And that's revolutionary because a slave owner did not need to compensate a slave. And yet, in Colossians 4, verse 1, Paul said, Master, has given to your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Second, it gave the slave a sense of personal dignity. They were not animals. They were created in the image of God. In Colossians 3, through 24, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So it redirected the attention of the slave to the one he actually was serving. And then third, it taught the masters and the slaves that they were brothers, destroying slavery. In Galatians 6, 9, and 10, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. So in the church, slaves are full and equal members and were to be treated as such. Now, that made sense to the early Christians because Jesus himself, according to Philippians 2, verse 7, came in the form of of a slave. So for Christians, slaves were complete in Jesus and equal to any other person. And the church took a different view of slavery, and we see this in Scripture. We see a very clear example of this in the book of Philemon. When you read the book, you know that Philemon was a Christian slave owner, and he owned a slave, a man by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus had escaped, and Onesimus had come into contact with Paul after, and after he had met Paul, he had been saved. Now, instead of telling Philemon to set Onesimus free, instead, he sent Onesimus back to him, and he told Onesimus that, that Philemon had ministered to him a man, he said, who had taken care of him as a prisoner. And he wanted, he says, to keep Onesimus at my side, but instead, he tells this man, I sent him back. In the midst of all that had taken place, Paul said the hand of the Lord was in this. Philemon, one, uh, Philemon verses 15 and 16. This is what he said. He said, For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul knew that slavery would be broken by genuine brotherhood. So in the case that Peter is dealing with, the question is simple. How do slaves interact with slave owners? And what if the owner is harsh or cruel? And under such conditions, without the possibility of freedom, how are you to respond? That's what he's talking about here. That's your context. Verse 18, he says, "'Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear.'" not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. This is commendable if because of conscience toward God, 
One endures grief, suffering wrongfully. So be submissive. Be submissive to the one that's easy to be submissive to. And be submissive to the one who is harsh. Submission is not to be based on how you're treated. I'm treated well, therefore I treat them well. No, it's grounded on something deeper. It's grounded on your fear of God, your relationship with God. Notice verse 19, it's commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief. So slave owners might think that that faith is something positive on the work site. That that would cause them to be kind and even gentle, he's saying, towards the slave. But others treated slaves harshly and inflicted great misery on them. So with this in mind, Peter commands them to serve with a proper attitude. Now, they're to do so, I want to point this out, not with this stoic resignation, but with a God-honoring attitude. In Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Now, Peter is instructing them because if they endure grief properly, they might win the slave owner to Christ. You need to, you need to consider how important that one thought I just gave you is. Today, there is such a minimization of the power of the gospel that people are caught up with the physical freedom, we'll say, of somebody and leave them in spiritual bondage because we think it's better that they no longer suffer in this particular way. But in fact, Paul had a heavenly attitude, and he said, no, they need to be set free from their sins. And keep that in mind. They need to have a relationship with God. And so if they're harsh, verse 20, what credit is it If when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, there's no merit for receiving a just punishment for something you've done that's wrong. You're receiving what you deserve. But on the other hand, if you endure harshness for doing what is right, that's what is commendable. He says in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer Of your souls. So, for to this you were called because Christ suffered for us. I went through a real harsh time in my life many, many years ago now as a young man and and really a, a relatively new believer. I felt that the Lord had been unkind to me. I used to take everything so personally, like God's got it, He's got it, He's He's got it out for me. He, he, he gets mad at me. He does things. I used to think that way. And, um, and I was going through a pity party. And I, I went and spoke to a pastor about it. And I said, this is how I'm feeling. And he said, this, he said to me, uh, he said, um, do you think that you're the only person who's ever gone through something bad? And I said, well, of course not. He says, look at what God did when he sent his son Jesus to take upon himself your sin and your punishment. Look at how he suffered. And you know how I responded to this guy? I said, that's his job. That's his job. He looked at me like, I better move out of this room. Lightning's (laughs) going to hit you, and I don't want to go with you. (laughs) But that's where I had gotten. Well, that's his job. And he had to explain to me some very deep things about the love of Christ that I had missed because of my, my narcissism, my thinking that the world had to go and revolve around everything I wanted and my desires and my plans. And no, I had to learn something. I had to learn about that. And that's the point he's making here. Christ suffered for us, and he left us an example. Slaves, you go through pain. Just remember, the pain you go through will never measure up to the pain that Christ did. Keep it in an eternal perspective. Now, we obviously, as believers, go through the same kinds of pains that everybody goes through. And we can suffer, and we do suffer. And sometimes we suffer because of our faith in Christ. 
we want things to go easier for us. But God uses everything to form us into the image of his son. In, in Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, uh, we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So these things you go through are actually forming you into the image of Christ. And he says here in verse 21 that Christ suffered for us. And notice in verse 21, he says, leaving us an example. The word example is used specifically of Jesus on two separate occasions in Scripture. You might find this interesting. The word example is used in two different places in reference to Christ. One of the places is found in John 13. When Jesus is there on the night that everything was being consummated and, and supper had already been ended and the devil already having put into the heart of Judas to betray him, Jesus rose from the table and he took a basin, girded himself with a towel and began to wash the feet of his men. You remember that story. And as he was washing the feet of the men, they were, they were just blowing their mind. And, and the apostle Peter, when, when Jesus came to the apostle Peter, he said, you will, are you washing my feet? You will not wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me, Peter. Then he said, then give me a bath because I don't want to be cut off from you. And Jesus said, look, if you've already bathed, the only thing that needs to be washed is your feet. It's a, there's a, a lot of deep meaning to that. But ultimately, he said this. After he had done so, he sits at the table. And he says, you call me master and you call me Lord. And this is good for, because that's what I am. If I then, being your Lord and master, have washed your feet, then ye ought to wash the feet of one another. I have done this as an example to you. And so that word example is used of Christ in service, in service. I have served you. Why didn't any of you scramble for that basin? Why did none of you get the towel? Why did you expect somebody else to do the foot washing, seeing that the host of this meeting in terms of the person who owned the room wasn't here? Somebody should have taken it upon themselves to at least have had the heart of a servant to do the washing of the feet. And none of you had that. So I have to show you what greatness in the kingdom of God is by doing it myself and by girding himself with that towel. It's reminiscent again of Philippians 2, 7, where Jesus had emptied himself and came as a slave. And so the word example is used of his service. But the other place is used here, and it's an example of his sacrifice. So what is it that we as Christians are supposed to learn? Sacrifice and service. Sacrifice and service. That's what we're learning. A life of submission to God and a willingness to suffer for his sake. He's pointing out something here. He's pointing out that Christ suffered for us. Notice in verse 22, he's pointing, him, pointing to him as an example. He suffered and he never deserved it because he committed no sin. His trial, his treatment, his torture, his death should give perspective to all believers. In Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 53, verse 3, speaking of Messiah, he is despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. So he's leaving us an example. How do we view such things? Well, instead of retaliating, he endured it. In John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. It's interesting to me that the world is very blatant and open about the things that it believes and the things that it does. And there's this cheering squad that is out there in the world that yells its approval for those who are hurting and lost. Marie and I today 
um, went to a cosmetic place. I needed to get some eyeliner. You know, we, <laughs> we went to a place to get some, some I don't know, some stuff, uh, some fresh paint for the barn. And, and as we were... <laughs> But while we were there, uh, we found the compact. It was a compact. We, we found it and went to, to purchase it. And, and I'm, as I'm approaching the, the clerk there behind the counter, both Marie and I look, and beautiful, long, black hair, perfectly adorned makeup, a young boy, a young boy, and I'm looking at him, and he's wearing a cross. And I'm looking at this young guy, and, you know, and Marie and I walk out, and the first thing my wife begins to say is, it made me very sad. It made me very sad. And you have to ask yourself, there's so many young people doing that today, and I'm not going to go into that right now, but I will at a later date talk a bit about it. But he wasn't born that way. He became that way. And in becoming that way, and there's a variety of reasons why, obviously, your heart has to go out to them. No, I don't approve of that. Of course not. Of course not. But my heart does pity and have compassion on somebody who's so lost, and somebody who's so hurting. It's just painful to see that. It's painful to see somebody confused. The gospel teaches us who we are in Christ. The gospel tells us about the God who is our Father, and, and, and right now, and I'll say one quick thing, um, I really see this as a product of the broken homes in our society where there are no fathers. And in our society where men are regarded as useless, we're nothing but, um, I use the word that I've heard, sperm donors. We produce children, but we are not necessary. And uh, look what our society has become. And yet when you say that, people get offended. Even people in church get mad and walk out, and you're a bigot. and you're No, that's, that's, that's a demonic spirit that's entered into the church. That's what that is. That's the spirit of confusion. That's Romans chapter 1. That's what that is. But even the church has confused love for acceptance, when in fact love doesn't accept Love has an expression of compassion, but tells the truth to set the sinner free. And that's why the church was given a message that will set somebody in bondage, set them free. And see, and so that's what we're called to do. That's how it works. And so Christ went through all of these things himself. And when he was, he was dealt with, when he was reviled, verse 23, uh, which means insulted, he didn't insult them in return. And he suffered, he speaks of his suffering. In other words... He lived out his own teachings. He had said in Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you and pray for those who despitefully use you. And so when Jesus was on the cross, he was reviled, but he didn't attack in return. Instead, when the two thieves were there next to him, what did he do? He prayed for them. Remember Luke 23, 34? Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. In Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. He says in verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree, which is a picture of the cross. He bore the punishment due to our sins as a substitute to atone for them. In John 1.29, it said that John the Baptist, who saw Jesus coming to him, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He did that when he became the sin offering for us. Take it upon himself, our transgressions. It says in Isaiah 53.12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So he says in verse 24, having died to sins, they might live for righteousness. We have a new life in Christ. Are you grateful for your new life? I, 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 you know, when I say that to you, 
I have to stop and ask myself, am I grateful for the new life that I have in Christ? And I have to say, for eternity, I will be. I am I'm eternally grateful for the life that God has given to me. I mentioned my friend Bobby Trujillo earlier. He and I, from the time we were 14, got in trouble together for a long time. We were very good friends, and he saw me through a lot of crazy times. And can you imagine what it's like now, at my age, to be friends with somebody that I used to go crazy with who now have a relationship with in the Lord? And we're, we're friends now forever. We're forever friends. We're, we're even deeper than that. We're forever family because we belong to the same God. We have the same Father. And so the joy that you have, Jesus died for our sins. He set us free. And we live as those who, who are free. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says at verse 15, he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It says in Romans 6, verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says in verse 24, by whose stripes you were healed. Spiritually, we have been healed. Sin has been dealt with. And fellowship with God is once again restored. Why? Well, he says in verse 25, you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, remember, he's writing to Jewish believers. And he's saying, you, before you were saved, you were living far away from God. But Jesus gathered you through his death, and Jesus is now your shepherd. And Jesus is the one who drew you. Like it says in John 12, 32, I, if I'm lifted from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And so the Holy Spirit has drawn us to the one who is our shepherd. We, as sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has gone his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah says. So Jesus took upon himself my sin, and he took that which he did not have, and he gave me something I did not have. He took my sin, but he gave me his righteousness. And so now I have what is called imputed righteousness. I have the righteousness of God in Christ. So when the Lord looks at you, He's not looking at you alone. He's seen you washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's seen the new creation that, that is new because Jesus Christ died on the cross to wash you, to cleanse you, to save you, to heal you, to forgive you, and to draw you to be with himself for eternity. And that's why he's speaking to these people and he's saying, you were sheep going astray. You weren't going in the right direction. But you've returned to the shepherd. You've returned to the overseer, the one who loves you the one who gathered you, and the one who cares for you. And for that, I hope we're all grateful. I hope we're all grateful.